Gentlemen, my name is Jaime de Bourbon Parme, and I would like to welcome you here to an insight and idea with Malika Sarapai. Malika Sarapai is a dancer, she's an actress, she's a choreographer, a writer, a public speaker, a social entrepreneur, and an instigator of communal projects. She celebrates the positive reaffirmation of images of womanhood, but she also challenges people like us here on issues of gender bias communal hatred, the environment, corruption, and violence. And she's currently the director of the Darpan Academy of Performing Arts. Now today we'll talk about the innovatively using arts to tackle social challenges such as women face in modern day India. But before, we've got the fantastic privilege to witness an actual performance by Malika today. Malika, please. Tomorrow I'll face the court. In the court will be the man who raped me, the principal of my school. No, there are no witnesses to my story. People saw him come into my house. But who saw the look on his face? Who heard the tear of my clothes? Who smelt my fear? I did then, and a thousand times since then, I still feel filthy. I was a teacher at a small village school. Both of us women teachers were used to the male teachers' jibes and their accidental touching. I didn't say anything. I thought, that's the way things were. He came to my home one evening. I have been getting complaints about you and I thought we'd better discuss them here. Otherwise things might get difficult for you, huh? Huh? I didn't know what he was talking about. He could see I was frightened. Suddenly I felt a hand on my shoulder. I felt comforted. And the hand slipped to my breast. I couldn't do anything, couldn't shout, couldn't scream. If you say anything about this, that's the end of your job. I'm a Brahmin and an officer. I'll say you're a slut. Nobody will marry you. Do you understand? I just lay there for hours. I thought if I didn't move, it would go away. It didn't go away. The blood dried on my thighs. The shock wore off and the anger began. Why didn't I scratch out his eyes? Why didn't I shout and scream? Why didn't I take him to the po police station? I must. I must report the crime. I must go to the police station. I must go to the police station. A fat policeman was sitting alone in the jockey. Excuse me. I, I have come to report a crime. I have been raped. Raped, huh? Eh? First time? <laughs> Virgin, huh? <laughs> Maybe the cow yara. Knock on the door saved me. A woman police officer came in. Please help me. I have been raped. Rap, eh? Rap, we rap. Eh, kya baat hai? Eh? Sali, you think something's gonna happen? Have you been to a doctor? Have you been examined? Poor Sali, kut nahi hogi Sali. Randiya kaha se aajati hai? I haven't been to a doctor. Perhaps I 
Perhaps I'm pregnant. The doctor was kind. He examined me and assured me I wasn't pregnant. Have you washed? Of course, doctor. It's been three days. That's a pity. Had I been able to examine the sperm, identification would have been made easier. But doctor, I know who it was. Yes, but nobody else does. The doctor told me how common rape is in the home, in the office, in the street. How rare a conviction is. He told me to forget about it and get on with my life. Like so many other women. But as I was going out, he told me about Shanta, a social worker who would explain the law to me. As I came out of the doctor's office, one part of me said, why are you making a fuss? So many women get raped, they just get on with their lives, just, just forget about it. But another part of me said, why? I'm not a culprit, I'm the victim. I want justice, I will have justice. Half an hour later, I knocked on Shanta's door. Shanta was kind, she was like a sister. She believed me. She said she would help me. The next morning, we went and filed an FIR. Three days later, I lost my job. And one night, late at night, a group of men came and started banging at my door. Give us a free fuck! Give us a free fuck! For five nights, every night! <laughs> I ran away to stay at Shanta's for four months. <laughs> then I heard that the principal had been given a promotion to a bigger school in another city. A promotion like that police officer who was given this big award after molesting a woman IAS officer. Where were the women who should have get out of this house? Where were the women who should have supported me? I began to think I had committed a crime just by talking about it. Then came the silence. Two years. No job, no press, no news from the court. Just, just reliving the incident again and again and again. But tomorrow he faced the court. And if he lies, it will be in front of the judges and all of you. Do you know what an MLA said last week about rape? He said that 90% of the women who are raped enjoy the sex. Is this really what men think? Is this all that men understand? A few months ago, my parents wrote. They also wanted to know why I just don't get on with my life. Why am I going on and on and on after this? And I looked at my life. And I thought about it. What is so great about being a woman in India? What is so fantastic about being a woman alive today here? That the fear of losing it will make me forget that I have been raped. Why don't you put it here? Put it here so that we can. 
face all of them. Malika, what, what a powerful performance. I, I saw the shock in everybody's face, and it comes very, very close. And, uh, I think uh, reading about this topic and saying how arts can play a role in, uh, in communicating, uh, you see how much more powerful it is if you role play than actually you speech about it. So, so why don't we begin first with your motivation? How did you come to this topic of, of using art uh, for this? Two things. One is that traditionally in India, and I'm talking like 2,000 years ago, all value education was done through the arts, whether it was um, teaching life skills through folk music and folk dancing, or it was you went to a temple and the sculptures told you stories of what was right and wrong, or you saw a dance and it was about the ethical quest or the spiritual quest. So we have a history of this, and then we seem to have lost it completely. Uh, but as a child, I used to watch my mother, uh, who is a classical dancer, who is the first classical dancer to have taken classical, classical dance outside the country as early as 1949. And by the time I was growing up, she was already using a form, Bharatanatyam, which is otherwise used as a search for the supreme, as a search for God, and so on. She found that it was a very powerful language, and she was using it as early as 1963, to talk about dowry debts. Now, dowry is something that she hadn't encountered growing up in Tamil Nadu and Kerala. She came to Gujarat, and she started reading in the newspapers about young brides jumping into the well. And she couldn't figure it out. She was learning Gujarati, and she kept saying to people, what is this? And she was so horrified that she used Bharatanatyam, which is a language of Shingara and beauty and so on, to talk about this hatred. So I actually grew up thinking that's what the arts are for. <laughs> Nobody told me that the arts are supposed to be for entertainment. <laughs> <laughs> we, we, see, we see that very clearly in all of your work. And, and I would suggest all of you to look at uh, her TED talk uh, on YouTube, which is incredibly powerful and shows also the richness of Indian culture and, and bringing a, a real message of education. So, so what are the major challenges uh, women face today in India? Being a woman. Being a woman. Being a woman, that's a problem? It's a, it's a huge problem. It's a huge problem. And the biggest challenge is that society, whether it is society as here, whether it's the corporate world, whether it's the government, has not realized the severity and the sin just the seriousness of what I call an epidemic of decimation of women across the board, across the board. And we think that you have education, you have a high-powered job, you are fine. And we are not, because the street has become dangerous. Look at the BPO um, uh, working women who are either murdered or gang raped or so on. So no woman is safe. But has it become different since your mother, say, time and, and now? Is yes, because worse? now we know so much more about how to kill and how to rape and how to mime and how to video while you are gang raping somebody and then you put it on MMS and you put it on internet. And but is it We more, know so much more. Is it more visible now or has it become a bigger problem? I think it's more visible now because we are fed a 24-7 violence, women commodification kind of thing on television, on the internet. The pornography industry is the fastest growing industry in the world. Uh, every kind of game that a child plays is about grasping a woman and breaking a woman. And, and it's just everywhere. This misogyny is everywhere at all levels. And I don't think people are realizing what this is doing. Mm -hmm. And of course, Bollywood is a huge, huge culprit in this. Uh, in that this was not the films of the 70s, what we are seeing today. In the 70s, there were stupid things, but they were not misogynist. Today, all you see is item numbers. And item numbers with, I don't know how many of you have seen this absolutely foul uh, song from Aya that Rani Mukherjee, all she does in a close-up camera is thrust her pubis at the camera for seven minutes. Hmm. And then there's this 
uh, uh, this singer called Happy Singh or Honey Singh, whose video went viral. And uh, the entire lyrics is about how I'll thrust my penis into you, tear you apart, and you will love it so much. You will be spurting blood. Now, this is the kind of this is the kind of culture that we are growing up in, mm. and for a society that is transmitting very quickly from the developing to this, this is what males get. This is how you become aspirational. This is this is how you prove that you are a modern male. This is how you prove that you are macho. Mm. And women form a great part of this whole play because it's very strange. Somebody was saying earlier, how is it that women uh, who have suffered also make other women suffer? Uh, this is the classic British divide and rule policy. You know, you tell a woman, oh, you know, first of all, arranged marriages means that you probably get married to somebody who doesn't love you to start with. If you're lucky, he starts loving you, otherwise not. So from the day of the wedding, in most Indian households, you will be made to feel an outsider. Meanwhile, your parents have said, this is not your real home. Go to your real home, which is the other home. So you have neither this nor this. Mm. So then mother-in-law starts harassing you. And what you think of is, one day I will have a son, and that son will love me. The daughter I will love, but the daughter has to go away to her house. So the son becomes the most coveted thing. And all my suppressed love, all my suppressed need for affection, for being valued as a woman, everything goes on to this one son. So when the son starts growing up, and if there is a wife and the wife has to be brought, then I am going to hate that wife because she is taking this one thing that I possess. Hmm. And that's the cycle. It's 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 uh, it's uh, as as a man. Uh, if I see this this performance, uh, I feel guilty uh, because I've, I I identify myself with the other men, and I see these horrible things happening. Um, so how do you educate men to uh, create two groups of men, men who identify themselves with it, but made a conscious choice of not being such a violent man, and uh, and so you create kind of support groups of, uh, of a new identity of men, because it's not just women needing to get emancipated, but mostly the guys need to be emancipated, it seems. Yes, yes, absolutely. But you know, it is such a complex social, political, religious, behavioral issue mm -hmm. that a warlike effort needs to be mounted from how we educate to how parents treat their children when they are little, daughter is sent off to make tea, son is sent off to play cricket, uh, this kind of thing all the way up. I mean, why is it that when it's a woman in the chair, you say chair woman or chair person, is the man not a person? Why is he then called chair man? Why, is, why are they both not chair people or persons? You always use he. When you're talking to somebody, you always he. Oh, but she comes into he. No, he comes into she. It's not the other way around. So he comes out of she, and there won't be many, many she's around soon. But what I'm saying is that there has to be government policy, there has to be out-of-the-box thinking, there has to be corporate policy, and language. The way we use language, the way newspapers use language. It's still called stupid things like Eve teasing. Yeah. You know, our mindset hasn't changed because we haven't taken it as a serious problem. It's still the problem of some woman in Haryana being gang raped. It's yeah. not here and now. People like us don't get this. So one response to that would be despair, saying the problem is so big, how can we ever make a difference? No. But on the other hand, in, in the WEF, we love complex systems. And to, to acknowledge complexity and then look at simple ways how you can tackle step-by-step -step issues. So what would be innovative ways here in, in India to tackle this Well, first problem? of all, I tell all parents, please, we bring up your children to be people, not Hindus, not Muslims, not Kayas, not boy, not girl. Just bring them up to be people with value for other people. That's number one. That's at the most basic level. Secondly, ask yourself when you are being gender prejudiced mm -hmm. in your answers, in your questions, in your responses. Women, for instance, I, I tell this to women in girls' colleges. I say, when one of your friends comes in particularly nicely dressed, why do you say, ah, dekh li, Salika, kaun samasti apne aapko? Rather than say, go up to her and say, you know, you look terrific. Where are you off to? Simple things like this change your mindset. And I have been trying to convince the government for 30 years. I've been trying to convince corporates with social responsibilities. We have a language through the arts. 
which can transform. We have statistically significant results over a 30-year period mm -hmm. using television, using, uh, using street theater, using all the Indian uh, folk theater forms and folk music forms that are dying out. You could give them a completely new life. We have a whole range of the uses of arts, but nobody is willing to listen. There are no people with vision to say, this is not funding dance and music. When you run a, a, a poster campaign, you are not funding printing. But they haven't been able to, in spite of our own cultural history, make this jump. So how, how, how do you bridge that, that challenge? Because so you're talking mostly about financing, so the arts are not financed to be able to not bring the arts. Okay. The arts may or may not be financed. That's not my point okay. here. We need to finance the possibility of rapid change in our society. Mm whether it's about gender, whether it's about human rights, whether it's about saving the environment, and the arts are the most transient language to do this. This language needs to be understood, and just as you have IT experts, you have experts who use the arts for change. Hmm. You need to actually make the environment so that they can leapfrog into upscaling what they have been doing. You, you mentioned in your plenary as well, you reached 40,000 women. What sort of project was that? How, how do you do that? You know, I was, I was, uh, I'm partially from Kerala, and I keep going back to Kerala, and over the last eight or 10 years, I've been horrified to see the repression of women. Um, they are educated, they are um, earning members, and yet they are so frightened to open their mouths. And I started just asking, I got an award, and there were lots of young women there, and I said, what's with you? And they said that, you know, if we open our mouths, we are the ones repri reprimanded. If we go and tell a teacher in our school that so-and-so whistled at me, then the teacher says, why did you take that route? Why couldn't you have taken another? Why did you go alone? Why didn't you go in a group? If in a bus I scream because somebody has put his hand on my breast, then I'm the one who gets yelled at. Nobody talks to me for the next mm -hmm. 10 days. And they say, I'm the one bringing attention on myself. So I went to the Kerala State Women's Development Corporation, who was giving me the award, and I said, you know, you have a very serious problem here. So in negotiating with them, we took case studies from them, and we created a fictionalized film called Unartha Pata, which is the song of awakening. Mm. And I personally, with a psychologist who speaks uh, Malayalam, I speak Malayalam, but not fluently, went to 40 women's colleges over a three-month period, showing the film and opening up a discussion. And you cannot imagine what comes pouring out. And they run after our cars and they say, ma'am, everything you say is absolutely contradictory to what our principal says. Our principal says, don't do this, don't talk about it, you mustn't discuss it, don't have a conversation about it, just shut up and go ahead. So, As a yeah. result of that, we have now got a website where anybody can ask us questions. Mm -hmm. The film is up there. And they have now asked us to make a feature film that will go to the larger public to sensitize men as well as women that having half your population repressed and suppressed and not speaking is extremely bad for the whole of society. I've seen in, uh, I've, I've been working a lot in conflict zones and Congo is another country where, where rape is used as a weapon of war and uh, structurally. So the first documentaries we helped finance was uh, awareness uh, on, on rape in general for the international public. But the second was focused on Congo itself. Ex-rapists, men who became older, that when they were 45, 50, they realized what they've done when they were 18 years old. And, uh, and they were talking in the documentary to other men, Wonderful. saying, uh, you know, we made a big mistake, <coughs> don't make the same mistake. And they were mediating between women that we've been uh, raped and the rapists to find some sort of closure. closure. You'll never close it. No. But at least a gesture makes uh, at least the, the guilt not only on the women, but also on the men. And uh, do you see any of these sides where you can bring the men, you try to shock them, wake them up, but can you also bring them on board? Um, I'm sure it's possible. I haven't tried it yet. Mm. What, one of the projects that we are trying to do just now is that, you know, we hear a lot of talk of dowry deaths and dowry violence, and you talk constantly about female feticide. The government makes one set of laws here and one set of laws here, none of which get actually followed up because the judicial system is the way it is. But people are not, at least people in policy making, don't understand that the two are actually the same problem. Because a woman is treated as a commodity that needs to be sold off to the husband's family, there are dowry debts. Because mm -hmm. the husband is actually saying, you bribe me X lakhs or X million, and then I will take this negative weight off you and I will keep her, and I will go on milking her to get more money, or I will kill her. 
And that's exactly the same reason why people don't want daughters. They don't want daughters because they don't want to get into a situation where they will have to have this huge debt. So we are, I'm trying to raise money, actually, one and a half crores, um, to try a pilot project in colleges, because they, these are the young people who will go into the marriage market in the next four or five years, to make them realize that what they consider just normal conversations between the two parties, ha, huh, we will bring a 1,000 people to the Bharat, and they need to stay in five-star hotels. This is the form that in many, many communities, dowry has taken. So they say, no, our community is the same. So we are trying to, with a performance, go in, start a discussion group, then try and get a small core group who will pledge that they will not be part of this system, train them to become trainers, get them to go to parents' groups and to teachers' groups. At the same time, device television programming that is beamed in every day, talking of different aspects of the same issue, but using the most popular genres of television. And at the same time, try and devise a way to gender sensitize professors, policy makers, people in university senates, vice chancellors, and teachers. Mm. So this is, this is the project that I'm at the moment going around with a begging bowl for. This sounds fantastic. So anybody here, um, the government doesn't usually support these kind of things. So we should all kind of and pledge in the, and the see. The point is, a lot yeah. of my work, I, I see my work as the R&D. Because, because we have a fully fledged arts institution, all of whom are committed to using the arts for change, we can try out lots of inventive ways, test market it, in Gujarat, come back, tinker with the model, go back, try it out again, do a pilot of a pilot, and then say, we can now go to any state. And they will put in a little localisms. But we can go to any state and train people to do this. We've just had a hugely successful project in Jharkhand um, in 475 villages, teaching people to take family planning seriously. And um, it was done with the Johns Hopkins University, who one year after the project went in to see how many people had converted from being an audience in this performance to actually going to the ASHA worker, which is the health worker, to ask about information on family planning. And they found to their astonishment that 85% of the couples in that age group had actually undergone family planning method, not only just asked. And this is an astonishing figure. Mm. Role play can be an incredible, strong, um, strong. And you method. must remember that we are primarily not a literate society, but an oral and a visual mm. society. I can go in the middle of any highway and I beat on a drum, and in two minutes I'll have five thousand people there. Yeah. Wow. Isn't that true? Yeah. It's true. It's true, and we are not using it. We we have. Um, um, uh, obviously, I mean, we, it seems that a lot of potential in India is locked in. 50% uh, of the workforce is locked in into, into cultural structures, uh, violent structures. Uh, that has an economic potential. I can, uh, we heard today that more and more women are getting employed in certain sectors. I could imagine that for them it would be very interesting to hire a creative person like yourself to organize workshops within the organization to transform and unlock this economic potential. That's a win-win situation. It's also a win-win situation for the whole world's heritage because there are so many art forms that are dying out and if we could inject this kind of energy into them, then they would have work, and they would have a new way, whether it's tamasha, or it's uh, wall paintings, or it's any of these. And it would mean that a lot of the art heritage of the world, which would otherwise disappear very rapidly, would also be saved, which is, again, a very, very important aspect of heritage. We, we came to India to, to learn, and, um, and um, we want to bring back a message to the rest of the world. Uh, what do we learn from you here in India? What is the message we have to bring back home to implement this kind of methodology of using arts to improve the situation of women in other parts of the world? What would be your message, your takeaway? <laughs> the takeaway has to come from you, not from me. <laughs> I think this whole thing about not seeing the wealth that you do and always seeing the wealth out there, mm -hmm. to be able to re-look at something that is very familiar to you, but might be used in completely different ways to solve completely different issues mm -hmm. is something that everybody needs to do. And I think creativity, um, there is, I, I deal with natural resources and with, with scarcity. There's one thing that is not scarce, and that's ingenuity of the mind. And uh, I think that's what, what uh, the takeaway I would have taken from this, uh, this session. Um, and another thing is that I see that culture, uh, there's, there's few countries in the world that have such a strong cultural identity as India. And you're actually using this massive strength to actually evolve the same culture into something more positive. 
So that will be my takeaway of the session. Thank you very much. Thank you. would have a new way, whether it's tamasha or it's uh, wall paintings or it's any of these. And it would mean that a lot of the 